Hi all, so today we're going to be entering our third and final unit of this class on human rights and security. We're going to be moving on from IPE, so if IPE was not your thing, I do hope that you can find um, something in this last unit that interests you. On that note, if there's something that we've studied thus far in this class that you would like us to go into a little bit more depth on, or if there's something, uh, a topic related to international relations or international projects, pro politics, excuse me, more broadly that we haven't touched on yet in this class and that you would like to talk about, please let me know. We do have a free class period built in on July 27th. Um, I left that period TBD on the syllabus just in case we got behind in the schedule or, or needed to cancel a class session for any reason so that we could catch up. But fortunately, we have not had to do that and we are right on track, so that means that um, we can talk about whatever you want that day. So if you have ideas for topics, let me know. I, I would really like to um, present on something and discuss something with you all that you have an intrinsic interest in. So send me an email and I'll keep reminding you. All right, so let's get started here. Uh, we're gonna be talking about international human rights law and the institutions that enforce that law again, and as well as international criminal justice. So we're going to spend the majority of the lecture sketching out the, the legal framework of international human rights law and, and the historical development of that framework and the institutions that enforce human rights law. And then we're going to be honing in on um, the International Criminal Court, the ICC, which is the topic of your third and final essay that I've assigned to you, and talking about how the ICC came to be as the international criminal adjudication organization, uh, inter inter International Criminal Court, as, it, as its name indicates, um, and then the, the modern challenges that that institution is facing, trying to set you all up to write your papers and also have a productive discussion about that on Wednesday. So without further ado, let's get into it. The first intergovernmental recognition of detailed human rights provisions in modern history was the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. So the International Codification of Human Rights started right here in the Americas, under the auspices of the Organization of American States, or the OAS. The OAS is headquartered in Washington, D.C. The United States is a member of the OAS, um, as well as uh, most of Latin America. The American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man was an absolutely radical document for its time. Um, not only did it present the first codification of human, of like detailed human rights provisions at the international level, it um, pr promoted this idea that alongside the rights that all human beings are entitled to, humans also have duties to, to themselves and to their communities. Um, there's, there's a quote from the American Declaration that I'll read aloud for you now. It says, the fulfillment of duty by each individual is a prerequisite of, of, uh, to the rights of all. Rights and duties are interrelated in every social and political activity of man. While rights exalt individual liberty, duties express the dignity of that liberty. Um, I think that's, that's a really beautiful quote that is, that is timeless and certainly applicable to today. Um, and this, this notion at the time was uh, very radical. It, the Declaration included a, a long litany of, of rights, including life, liberty, and personal security, equality before the law, religious freedom, freedom of expression, right to fail tr fair trial, etc. You know, in, in modern times, we see these as all um, uh, very fundamental and um, requisite rights. But at that time, those rights had never been articulated on the international scale in that way. But the Declaration also included a number of rights that we might consider to be more progressive, um, including uh, the right to preservation of health and well-being, uh, the right to special protection for mothers and children, the right to residence and movement, the right to education, the right to leisure time, the right to social security, etc. These are all rights that um, simply by um, virtue of our community we are supposed to have access to and that the state has an obligation to, to provide us with. Alongside that, the American Declaration included this list of duties, including the duty to protect and educate children, the duty to vote, the duty to obey the law, the duty to serve the community and nation, 
duty to pay taxes, duty to refrain from political activities in a foreign country, etc. This um, parallel nature of, of rights and duties is, is a major contribution of, of the American Declaration of, of the Rights and Duties of Man. Um, and it animated the biggest developments in international human rights uh, codification and international human rights law that we saw um, beginning in the 1940s. So the uh, American Declaration, first of all, it, it deeply influenced the drafting of the American Convention on Human Rights uh, several, um, almost two decades later, or a little over two, dec two decades later in 1969. And that uh, instrument, as we'll talk about in a few slides, is the document that created the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Uh, beyond that, though, the American Declaration was exceedingly influential in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted a few months later by the United Nations. The UDHR was the first um, global uh, commitment to, to specific human rights. It included uh, rights to life, liberty, security of person, um, the provision of, or the um, prohibition of slavery, the prohibition of torture, um, the commitment to um, the right to an effective remedy by competent national tribunals for acts violating fundamental rights, um, the right of everyone to a fair trial, the right to a nationality, the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association, um, etc., cetera, um, including it's some of those what we might see in the modern lens to be a little bit more radical rights, at least in the modern American lens, um, of, of a right to education, the right to um, adequate health and well-being, food, clothing, housing, medical care, social services, the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, or old age, et cetera. All of that gets built in to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that is directly due to the influence of these um, mostly Latin American human rights visionaries who, who wrote the American Declaration. So the thing about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's a foundational document, and if you have not read it yet, I know I just listed off a couple of rights there, but it's, it's really worth the time to go back and, and read it. So I, I would encourage you, if you haven't read it yet, to, to look it up. Um, because it's something that everyone should read. But the thing about it is that it's not legally enforceable. It's, it was adopted by the UN General Assembly, and declarations adopted by the General Assembly um, are not legally binding in any way. So moving forward, the UN knew that they had to find a way to make these rights provisions enforceable in some way in the inter on the international level. So in, in doing so, and, and out, of a, um, out of the political will of states as well, Two uh, conventions emerged out of the United Nations system that really became the bedrock of all international human rights recognition today. And those are the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And these were both adopted in the year 1966 and they came in force in 1976. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, includes as its name states, civil and political rights, such as the right to life, freedom from torture, equality before the law, right to a fair and speedy trial, protection from arbitrary detention, freedom of assembly, association, et cetera. The US has signed and ratified the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights protects a, a different set of rights, including the right to form and join a union, the right to strike, um, prohibition against forced marriage, the right of everyone to an adequate standard of living, including adequate food, clothing, and housing, and to the, quote, continuous improvement of living conditions, uh, the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right of education, and the right of everyone to take part in cultural life and to, quote, enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. Um, pretty unsurprisingly, the U.S. signed but did not ratify this instrument, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, um, primarily due to uh, ideas within American government regarding um, the provision of things like um, welfare and um, adequate clothing, housing, 
and food. You know, we don't have universal health care in the U.S., and that would be seen to be a contradiction to the ideals in this covenant. So um, for those reasons um, and a variety of a long story of political resistance from the U.S., um, that we can certainly talk about more in discussion, but it's a long story, so I won't go into it here and bore you. Uh, the U.S. never actually ratified that covenant. So these treaties, um, while they are enforceable in and of themselves because they are international treaties that have been ratified by um, state parties, the U.N. realized that they needed a, a um, more solid enforcement mechanism for both the, the ICCPR, which is the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, and the International Covenant on um, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the ICESCR. So in order to do that, the UN created the Human Rights Committee, and this committee hears disputes regarding state um, provision of the rights guaranteed under the ICCPR. There's a similar committee called the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which does the same thing regarding state compliance with the ICESCR. Um, and then there's several other UN committees that each enforce their own conventions. For example, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination enforces the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination, et cetera. Um, the, the CEDAW, which is the Committee of the Elimination of Discrimin against, uh, Discrimination Against Women, enforces the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. So each of these treaty bodies, um, they have dispute solving powers. They also have monitoring and um, reporting powers. So there's a, there's a process called universal periodic review in which, in which each UN member state that is a party to each of these various conventions will report on their progress for compliance with that convention um, on a periodic basis. It's every couple of years. They'll send a report uh, to the respective committee regarding how well they're, they're holding up with their commitments. So uh, the US might have a universal periodic review due. I'm not sure if it's due next year or not, but for the sake of argument, we'll, or for the sake of the example, we'll just say that next year the US might have a universal periodic review due for the Committee Against Torture. So they would submit um, documents to the UN Committee Against Torture, um, ideally proving all of the ways in which they have not used torture over the past several years or the ways in which they've improved their interrogation techniques for um, people who are suspected of, of crimes against the US. Uh, for example, in Guantanamo, that's been a huge issue that the Committee Against Torture has been involved in. And then the Committee Against Torture will review the documents that the uh, US has submitted, review their progress compared to the last universal periodic uh, review, and then put out a, a report that calls on the U.S. to um, fix certain practices, implement certain policies, or um, in, in very rare cases, the U.N. treaty bodies will say, nope, you're good, you're doing great. Um, that rarely ever happens, though, <laughs> not only for the U.S., for, for um, most, most all countries have, have issues with one or more of the treaty bodies at, at one point or another. So that's one mechanism of human rights enforcement. You also have um, a whole system of human rights enforcement that is centered around international courts. The UN treaty bodies are not courts. Um, technically, their decisions are not legally binding, um, but they are effective in many ways, particularly for um, uh, targeting non-compliant states with international pressure. But international courts in and of themselves issue legally binding decisions. And there's two models that we're gonna talk about today for how to enforce accountability for human rights abuses. And um, these, I, yes, I, I, I did assign you a question, didn't I? Yes, sorry, I'm second guessing myself here. In your third essay, part of the uh, essay prompt that you have to answer is whether or not you think that the state accountability model or the individual criminal accountability model is more effective for enforcing international human rights guarantees. So we're going to be going through each of those models in turn and discussing some of the various institutions at the international level that use these models to hopefully inform you and help you make a better um, assessment of, of which model you think is preferable when you write that essay. There is no right answer. Um, international human rights lawyers and policymakers have been arguing for decades over which model is, is preferable for um, 
particularly for helping states move on from um, conflict situations and co uh, consolidating democracy. So this is an ongoing debate. You can't have a wrong answer. Um, but I do want to see that you're thinking through the different implications of these different models. So we'll start with the state accountability model. Under this model, quite simply, the defendant in any given human rights dispute is going to be the state. Like you see this um, little screenshot I took of a court judgment, the heading of a court judgment from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This is the case of the Dos Eres mas massacre uh, v. Guatemala. And um, you see that the defendant here is not any particular person um, who may have committed the massacre or participated in the massacre. It is the state of Guatemala itself is defending itself for um, participating in um, or uh, facilitating this um, tragic massacre that occurred um, in the context of the Guatemalan civil conflict. So the state accountability model endorses a collective as opposed to individual responsibility for state-sponsored human rights violations. According to this model, states are the ultimate duty bearers for upholding human rights standards. And this has roots in the so social contract philosophy coming out of um, Rousseau, Hobbes, and Locke that um, by virtue of belonging to a nation state, that state has certain duties to you. The state has duties to the citizens of its state, um, and some of those duties include protecting fundamental human rights. So therefore, when those rights get violated, it's not necessarily the, the culpability or, or the, the duty of any particular person to, to pay or be, or be punished for the violation of that right. Um, the state itself has a collective responsibility for the fact that human rights were violated and it must um, compensate for that and it must um, guarantee that those sim similar rights will not be violated in similar ways in the future. So it's this idea that, that state governments should be collectively held accountable for human rights abuses committed either at the direction of the state or by the negligence of the state. Um, so it could be that the state was directly involved in torture, for example, or that the state knew that insurgents were torturing citizens and simply didn't do anything about it. That could also be um, a, a fundamental rights violation. And this, this model is applicable to a broad range of civil, political, and physical integrity rights. The idea is that states have to remedy human rights abuses typically through damages paid to injured parties. We could also call these reparations. Um, so for example, the, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights did find Guatemala guilty in this um, case of the Dos Eres massacre. Um, so Guatemala was ordered to pay financial reparations to the victims of this, this massacre and their surviving family members. States are also expected to remedy human rights abuses through policy change in this model. Um, so policy change can mean a, mean a variety of things. In the context of like a post-mass atrocity, like a state-sponsored massacre, policy change could mean establishing a truth commission to figure out what happened and publicize um, the crimes of the state. Um, policy change could mean memorialization of the victims in a public place. Uh, policy change could mean removing the officials who were in office, at the, the political officials who were in office at the, the time of the massacre from their posts. And um, the, this is typically called lustration, which means removing people um, from government, um, their government positions so that you can have a turnover in institutions, which is supposed to help facilitate greater trust in new institutions after a trust shattering um, event like like the state-sponsored massacre of human beings um, policy change could be a reformulation of the military if the military was involved in, in committing any um, atrocities and, and a massacre is a very um, intense example but this can be applied to to a wide range of of um, not only physical integrity rights but civil and political rights as well for example if a state was found guilty of suppressing the right of some of its citizens to vote um, an international court could mandate that it implement policy change such as um, uh, allocating more resources to um, voting voting stations, for example, similar to idea or similar to issues that we've seen um, in in states in the American South in in recent 
weeks with um, particularly there not being enough access to voting booths in majority African American communities. If the U.S. was um, party to any international courts, which it's not, theoretically an international court could order the U.S. to um, distribute polling stations in a more equitable way across um, the the demographics of the communities which are which are entitled to vote. So, basically, there's two prongs of this um, victim compensation or um, accountability. Um, framework under the state accountability model and that are rep those are reparations so those are um, these individual damages paid to the actual victims in a case as well as guarantees of non-repetition which are supposed to be um, guarantees to the broader society the idea is that human rights crimes are not only harmful to the people who suffer them but they're harmful to the the collective um, the collective society as well so these guarantees of non-repetition ensure that the the society will never the society will never be subject to similar um, violations of um, of their rights in the future so some institutions that adopt the um, state accountability model include the regional human rights system um, so there are three regional human rights systems in the world those are the European Court of Human Rights the uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the African Court of Human Rights, and I have their respective logos laid out here. The European Court of Human Rights is the oldest. It uh, was founded through the 1950 European Convention on Human Rights, and the court began operations in 1959. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights, um, which I mentioned a little bit in the beginning, came into being through the American Convention on Human Rights, which was drafted in 1969 and very much based off of the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man, which again was in 1948. The Inter-American Court did not start operating until 1979. Remember that after you um, write a treaty such as the American Convention, the states have to, the, the various representatives of the um, states who helped to negotiate the treaty have to sign it, but then they have to take it back to their domestic publics to ratify it. And every treaty typically includes a provision that it will not actually go into force until a certain number of states ratify the treaty. So in the case of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, that uh, ratification process to get the requisite number of states on board ended up taking a bit longer, which is why the court didn't actually come into being until 10 years after um, the, the American Convention that created the court was, was signed. The newest regional human rights system is the African Court of Human Rights. And this court was founded in 2004. It includes 30 member states. Sorry, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah, 30 member states. Only nine of those states have actually accepted the jurisdiction of the court to hear cases that are submitted by individuals or NGOs. Um, the other 21 member states have only submitted um, the consent to jurisdiction for the court to um, interpret the meaning of the African Convention on, on Human and People's Rights in the context of an interstate dispute or what is called uh, an advisory opinion, where the court isn't actually ruling on any particular dispute involving specific circumstances, but is more giving um, advice about whether hypothetical state practices um, or existing state practices are in accordance with, with the convention. So all these um, courts implement the state accountability model because in each case uh, in each case that that comes before these courts the defendants are not individuals themselves um, often the applicants are the or the um, in, in domestic legal terms it would be the plaintiff often the plaintiffs are individuals themselves but the defendants are never individuals the defendants are always the state and the state can uh, include regimes that were not actually the regimes that committed the atrocity. So if one um, if one's regime or government was committing acts of torture, um, acts of arbitrary arrest against its population, and then there was a regime change, so elections or a coup or something that caused um, a new government to come into place, that government can still be held accountable for the actions of the previous government. Um, 
providing with the caveat that the court has jurisdiction, has temp what we call temporal jurisdiction to hear cases from previous years. And in some cases it does, and in some cases it doesn't. And if you're interested in that, I'm literally writing a whole dissertation about temporal jurisdiction and regional human rights courts. So I would be more than happy to have a conversation with you about it. Um, but for what you need to know right now is that um, uh, under a specific set of circumstances, it is possible for states to actually be held accountable for um, human rights violations that were committed by a previous government. Another court that uses the state accountability model is the International Court of Justice, or the ICJ. This is the judicial branch of the United Nations. The ICJ has jurisdiction to um, interpret the compatibility of state practice with a broad array of, of international law, and the International Court of Justice's rulings are actually considered to be international law. Um, when, the, when the ICJ issues a ruling, that whatever legal interpretation is included in that ruling is now considered to be a part of the body of international law. This is not the case with the regional human rights courts. When regional human rights courts issue a, issue a legal interpretation, it's only um, binding within that regional jurisdiction. It's not considered to join sort of the wider corpus of um, global international law. So the ICJ is, is a very powerful court and the, the ICJ um, is, is another court that uses the state accountability model. So the defendants here are states. The ICJ um, issues advisory opinions and settles specific disputes regarding the compatibility of state practice with international law. And the ICJ is not only a human rights court, I should, I should point out. They hear all sorts of international legal disputes. Um, however, they have um, developed a significant amount of jurisprudence in the human rights realm. So that's the state accountability model, where the states are the defendants. The second model that we'll talk about today is the individual criminal accountability model. So here, the defendants are individuals themselves who commit human rights violations or are accused of committing human rights violations. So this model endorses individual responsibility for human rights violations committed under the auspices of or in collaboration with state or, in some cases, non-state actors. This model has its roots in the post-World War II Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes trials, where individual Germans and Japanese military officials were tried for their participation in war crimes in World War II. It wasn't the state of Germany that was going on trial. It wasn't the state of Japan. It was individual um, military officials. And US President Harry Truman, um, who was obviously deeply involved in orchestrating and, and pushing for these trials, um, of the, he, he didn't know that he was talking about the individual criminal accountability model at this time. Again, the, the um, Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes trials were the first real international um, trials for, for war crimes or, or international trials uh, for human rights crimes in general in the history of um, the modern world. So he didn't know that he was talking about this model at the time, but he, but he promoted it. He said, we do not accept the paradox that legal responsibility should be least where power is the greatest. And this was a direct um, rejection of what was a, um, an international norm at that time. And to some extent, uh, but, but a degraded extent certainly is, is the case today, um, which is this idea of head of state immunity, that heads of state can be um, declared not legally accountable at the international level for their actions. Um, the, the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes trials were the first rejection of, of that diplomatic norm. So the ICA model holds that individuals should be held accountable for human rights abuses that they commit or that are committed under their direction. Um, so this goes against this idea that uh, a lot of military officials uh, throughout modern history who have been subject to um, prosecution at a, at a variety of both domestic and international courts have used, which is that, oh, this was my, this was my job to carry out orders, so um, therefore I should be either held not culpable or less culpable for what I did, um, if, even if those orders involved, for example, torturing civilians, committing other rights abuses against civilians, et cetera. So the individual criminal accountability model is in some ways a rejection of this excuse that, oh, I was just following orders. However, um, throughout history, we see that the individual criminal accountability model has been applied mostly to very high level um, state and military officials. So 
not your regular soldiers. You know, you're not going to see a private in the army getting brought before an international war crimes tribunal. You're going to see the the general that um, uh, made the order to the private to commit the war crime uh, actually brought before the tribunal. Um, so there's there's sort of a slippery distinction there, but it's important to point out. And this the state accountability, or excuse me, the individual criminal accountability model is applicable to um, to primarily these mass fundamental f physical integrity rights violations like genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. In other words, um, a civil rights violation like suppressing someone's right to vote is obviously egregious. Uh, but someone is not going to, an individual is not going to be brought in front of an international criminal tribunal if it was found that they, as some sort of government bureaucrat, were involved in voter suppression. Um, that's not going to happen. Really, these uh, international criminal trials are reserved for people who commit the most horrific actions that human beings can commit against one another, like genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So recall in um, the state accountability model that there was a sort of two-pronged approach to remedies to human rights violations within that model, reparations and um, broader collective policy change on the part of the state. Obviously, an individual cannot implement policy change to guarantee that no other individual commits, or no other individual um, uh, commits rights violations similar to what they did. So guarantees of non-repetition are not as easy to secure under the individual criminal accountability model. But individuals can be sentenced to jail time for human rights crimes, and in some cases they can be ordered to pay financial reparations or fines to their victims or the families of, of the victims of whatever crime they committed. So several important tribunals throughout history have used this individual criminal accountability model. These include what we call the UN ad hoc tribunals. They're called ad hoc because they're not permanent. They were created to respond to a particular crisis um, and then they are dissolved when that crisis has been dealt with. So the first of these was the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia to try uh, uh, primarily war crimes committed by state and military officials during the um, wars in the Balkans in the early 90s um, that accompanied the breakdown of, of the former Yugoslavia. This criminal tribunal, the ICTY, was located in The Hague in the Netherlands, and um, its tenure stretched from 1993 to 2017. During that tenure, it issued 161 indictments, and it convicted 90 people. Notable indictees include Slotoban Milosevic, excuse me, who was the first sitting head of state to be indicted for war crimes in the history of, of the modern world, um, and Ratko Mladic, who um, was a Bosnian Serb military commander, and he was responsible for the siege of Sarajevo and the Srebrenica massacre. Um, if you'll, you probably saw this in the news last week, but we commemorated the um, 25th anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre last week. Um, this was a massacre in which um, Bosnian, uh, Bosnian Serb militants basically surrounded a um, area where about 8,000 Bosnians, uh, Bosnian men and boys in particular, had been led into a safe zone by United Nations humanitarian intervention uh, troops and um, you know the UN peacekeeping forces aren't actual military forces they couldn't actually defend these people so uh, those 8,000 um, uh, Muslim men and boys were murdered in, in the Srebrenica massacre and it was um, the the largest violent um, act against civilians in Europe since World War II so that happened 25 years ago today, and this ICTY was instrumental in convicting the military and um, state officials who orchestrated that massacre, as well as other horrific crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, the ICTY was the site of perhaps the most dramatic incident in international law, um, at least certainly that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, during the ICTY's final hearing in 2017, when it was getting ready to shut down, uh, shut down operations because it had completed its mission, 
a former Bosnian Croat general whose name was Slatoban uh, Praljek was standing in the courtroom and the, um, the judge read aloud that um, his appeal had, had failed. Uh, Slotoban had been convicted previously of war crimes in the former Yugoslavia, and then he had appealed that conviction. The judge announced that the conviction was upheld um, and that uh, Project had, Slotoban Project had to, to serve his time. Upon doing this, Slotoban Project announced to the, to the courtroom, I am not a war criminal and took a vial of potassium cyanide out of his clothes, drank it in the courtroom, and then died. Um, which is, was just incredibly disturbing uh, and, and dramatic and um, definitely one of the craziest things I have ever seen in, in my studies of international law. So high drama here at the, at the ICTY. The other international um, UN-sponsored ad hoc tribunal that has um, been implemented thus far, and there's always the, there there have only been two so far, um, with the exception of the there was uh, an agreement with it's called the Extraordinary Chambers, oh what's it called? It's like the Extraordinary Chambers of the Criminal Court of Cambodia um, was a UN and Cambodian national government partnership to try um, war criminals. Um, and uh, state officials who committed crimes against humanity during the Khmer Rouge uh, dictatorship in Cambodia. Um, so other than that case, which is a, sort of doesn't fall under this category because um, it was a, it's primarily a national court that is sort of conducted with um, collaboration from, from the UN. Uh, the only other ad hoc tribunal that has been implemented uh, thus far in the course of history has been the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was of course created to address the crimes of the Rwandan genocide, during which somewhere between half a million to a million people were murdered in, in 1994. So the tenure of that tribunal lasted from 1994 to 2015, and the headquarters of the court was located in Arusha, Tanzania. The court issued 93 total indictments and 62 convictions, and uh, notable indictees include Jean-Paul Akeesu, who's the first person to be convicted of genocide in an international tribunal, like in, in modern history, um, or really in the history of the world. And Pauline uh, Niramasu, Niramasuhuko, um, who was the, the first woman to ever be convicted of genocide. And the ICTR was the first international tribunal to hold members of the media responsible for inciting genocide. If you've ever studied the Rwandan genocide, you'll know that the radio hosts in particular um, in certain Rwandan towns were inciting people to kill each other. They were um, broadcasting false information. And the ICTR recognized that this was, had actually been a major motivation in this um, civil violence. So the um, ICTY, or excuse me, the ICTR actually issued, they had a court case, it's called the media case, simply it's called the media case if you ever want to look it up, where um, they condemned uh, members of the media for, for inciting genocide. Finally today we're going to talk about uh, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which is again the focus of that third essay uh, question that I've um, assigned to you. So the ICC is also a court that uses international um, criminal accountability as a model. So the defendants are always individuals in this court. It was established through the Rome Statute and entered, which that statute entered into force in 2002 and that created uh, the court. There are 123 state parties to the International Criminal Court. The US is not one of them. And the court functions primarily on the principle of what we call complementarity in international law, which means that the ICC can only prosecute individuals when their state or the state in which the um, violations were committed were, refuses to prosecute individuals um, who have committed one of four crimes. The ICC can only prosecute individuals for these four crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war, and the crime of aggression. Uh, the crime of aggression is, is a new sort of serious crime uh, or particularly grievous human rights crime that has emerged within international law in recent years. And what it means is the um, 
deliberate use of force to violate another state's sovereignty. So if you're a military official that has directed that and your state or the state in which um, you committed this violation is a, is a party to the ICC, you can be brought before the court for um, using force to violate um, state sovereignty. So the ICC has jurisdiction over these four categories of crimes only if one of three um, conditions take, is um, one of three conditions holds. And I think I already mentioned this. Um, the, the crime has to take place on the territory of a state party, um, or the crime has to be committed by a national of a state party, or the crime has to be referred to the ICC Office of the Prosecutor by the UN Security Council. Um, Russia, China, the US, none of them have ratified the Rome Statute. So it's, it has, uh, there's never been a case that has been referred by the UN Security Council um, to my now, no, there, no, there hasn't been a case. Um, and there's, there's unlikely to be, particularly given, as, as we're going to talk about later in this uh, presentation or this lecture, the U.S. Um, is extremely opposed to the, to the ICC, and that opposition has um, worsened with uh, the Trump administration. So the ICC has issued 44 indictments in its tenure, but has only convicted four people, um, which is a major critique of the institution, is that it is inefficient, uh, it's not working fast enough. It's um, allocating resources inappropriately because, because how could a court exist for, at this point, 18 years and only convict four people? The reality is that convicting someone for genocide, crimes against humanity, or, or war crimes um, takes such a long time. It in involves a, a years-long investigation process um, prosecution, um, gathering information from, from different state parties, getting a, um, the indicted person extradited from whatever country they're in to The Hague, which is where the ICC is located. Um, so the ICC can certainly be criticized for this low um, number of convictions. However, I think it's necessary to just emphasize um, the amount of, of legal resources and time that is necessary to, to build a case like this, um, for the prosecutor to build the case and then for it to actually go to trial and to get the person who was accused of the crime in the courtroom in the first place. Um, that, it, it's honestly kind of a miracle that they've convicted anyone at all. So here's the map of um, signatories to the ICC. You can see that all the state parties are in green. Again, there are 123 state parties. The states that are in yellow have signed the Rome Statute, but have not ratified it, so therefore they're not subject to the jurisdiction of the ICC. Uh, you will see states like the United States and Russia and Turkey and Yemen and Algeria and Egypt, um, etc. And then you have in red the um, states that never even signed the Rome Statute. So you'll see North Korea, India, Somalia, Liberty, or <laughs> Liberty, woo! Slip of the tongue, Libya, um, uh, Turkey. Oh, sorry, Turkey is, the, is, is in red. They have never signed. Um, Cuba, et cetera. So here are the four men who have been convicted by the ICC. You have Thomas Lubanga, who's a Congolese militia leader. Um, Jermaine Katanga, who was a Congolese rebel leader. Jean-Pierre Bemba, who's the former Congolese vice president, as well as militia leader and Ahmed al-Faki al-Mahdi, who was a Malian militia leader. What you will notice about all of these men is that they are African. This has led the ICC to come under severe accusations that they disproportionately target um, African criminals, and that there is some sort of uh, bias built into the organization. So let's talk about that. Um, Kenneth Roth is, I believe, the author of the article that I assigned to you on uh, backlash from African states against the ICC. If you have not read that article yet, please do so, because that's going to be pretty critical um, to both your essay and our, and our discussion on Wednesday. So there's this accusation that the, the ICC prosecutor disproportionately targets Africans. You see in this little cartoon here. The man walking with the briefcase is Luis Moreno Ocampo, who was the um, prior chief prosecutor of the ICC. 
um, before the one we have now. And he's being chased by a crowd of reporters, and they say, how come you never prosecuted crimes against humanity in Syria? And he says, Syria is not in Africa. So this cartoon is obviously trying to point out that uh, the ICC is, is biased in some way. Um, and the ICC has, has faced extensive criticism from both the African Union, uh, and the African Union is the political organization that the African Court of Human Rights, um, the Af excuse me, the African Court of Human and People's Rights is um, housed under. So it's a, it's a political association, but it has its own judicial branch. And the African Union has extensively criticized the ICC in recent years for this um, perceived bias against African leaders. Uh, there have been states that have withdrawn and threatened to withdraw. So in 2016, South Africa and Burundi announced their intention to withdraw from the ICC. South Africa eventually reversed that decision. Uh, South Africa, the, the controversy there uh, emerged after um, uh, the former um, dictator of Sudan had traveled to South Africa and he was in the process of being extradited by the ICC, so there weren't many states that would take him um, because then they knew that if he was within their territory, the, the ICC would then be pressuring uh, that state to extradite him. So, so, he, so he went to, um, oh, what was his name? Al-Bashiri. Um, Al-Bashiri went to South Africa uh, on a visit, and South Africa refused to extradite Al-Bashir to the um, ICC, which caused this huge political controversy. Um, and, and, South, and South Africa pretty quickly after that decided to announce their intention to withdraw from the ICC um, given perceived incursions into South African sovereignty and, and independent political decision making. Um, Burundi withdrew because uh, the ICC had launched an investigation into uh, human rights violations during Burundi's many decades of, of civil conflict. So Burundi actually did formally withdraw from the ICC in, in 2017. And they, uh, I, I picked out this, this quote from a uh, presidential spokesperson that really encapsulates this, this, Afri some, this critique that some African governments have of, of the court, which is that, quote, the ICC has shown itself to be a political instrument and a weapon used by the West to enslave. This is a great victory for Burundi because it has defe defended its sovereignty and national pride speaking of the um, withdrawal from, from the ICC. So there's this idea that the, because the only people that the ICC has ever either indicted or found guilty have been Africans, um, and the ICC uh, investigations have, disp have been disproportionately targeted towards uh, civil conflicts in Africa, the, the ICC is yet another Western imperialist organization that is trying to use international law as an instrument to um, violate the, so the sovereignty of African uh, nations, sort of as, as a legal continuation of colonialism. Uh, so Burundi actually went through with it. Um, South Africa, decided, once the whole um, al-Bashiri con uh, controversy died down, they decided to, to withdraw that decision. And I believe the South, uh, South African Supreme Court actually issued a, a decision blocking the government's attempt to withdraw from the ICC. So, so thus far, we only have Burundi, who, who is withdrawn. But still, um, there, there have been many states at various points that have threatened to withdraw. Kenya, in particular, has threatened to withdraw a number of times. So what can we make of this, what looks like to be a, some sort of disproportionate targeting of, of ICC, uh, or of African states by the ICC? Uh, well, Kenneth Roth, um, he, he goes through several potential reasons for this, one of which is that the largest block of ICC member states is from Africa. The largest regional block of states is, is African. There's thir 33 um, African uh, member states of, of the WCC. And African states were crucial in negotiating the Rome Statute. The um, Simmons and Danner piece that I assigned to you goes into this in, in much greater detail. But there, the, those authors' whole argument is that Ratifying the Rome Statute and um, negotiating the Rome Statute to um, include language that uh, would make it easy, well, I don't want to say easy necessarily, but would facilitate the um, international um, enforcement of, of criminal law in a way that was previously unprecedented in, in, in the realm of international law. Um, that by negotiating that sort of language into the Rome Statute and making this court 
a court that um, was independent of sovereign interests and could really um, have power to crack down on, on war criminals, um, that this was a sign of a credible commitment by some of these African states that had been plagued by civil conflict for decades to pave a more stable and democratic future for themselves. Um, there, there's an argument that uh, that Sim Simmons and Danner put forth that these states that traditionally or, or historically had the weakest um, domestic judicial systems and, and were the least of the least able to domestically enforce human rights law were the quickest to ratify the Rome Statute because they wanted to send a signal to the international community that they were committed to staying on the right path and that they were committed to holding their leaders accountable. And if they knew that the domestic institutions were not there to hold their leaders accountable, they were going to ratify this um, uh, treaty so that the leaders could be potentially brought in front of an international court in the case that um, domestic institutions were not able to prosecute them. So there's an argument that um, the ICC has, it has experienced uh, disproportionate support from African states starting with its founding compared to uh, support from states from other regions. Um, because these um, uh, states that were participating in, in the negotiating body of the Rome Statute were so determined to evidence their respect for human rights and signal um, a, a credible commitment to, to democratization. Um, so we have to keep this in mind, that um, an institution that has historically experienced support from a certain region might actually be more willing to go um, and, and prosecute people from that region because they know that governments are going to be more likely to extradite war criminals and that they're going to have more popular support am among the people um, for international court prosecutions. Um, so there's the jurisdictional issue that, just quite frankly, a lot of um, states where the most horrific civil conflicts have happened over the past uh, couple of decades um, has coincided with a group that largely has subscribed to the ICC. Um, and then this, this history of African cooperation with the ICC, um, again, keep in mind that the ICC relies heavily on state cooperation to um, extradite war criminals, as well as to just get investigations into civil conflicts started. You'll notice that in um, that past slide, I'll, I'll go back to it here, three of these men are Congolese, and that's not a, a mistake. The, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, after a, a sort of fragile peace uh, agreement was negotiated in the Congolese Civil War, the DRC sent a referral to the ICC asking the ICC to look into war crimes, crimes against humanity, and, and genocide committed by all sides of that civil conflict, of, of which there were many. It was a very complicated conflict. So the ICC is not just seeking out the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, to go after that country in particular. The, the post-peace agreement government of the Congo actually reached out to the ICC, gave them what is called this referral to prosecute. Um, and that could be a potential reason why we see three of these convictees from um, the, the DRC as, as opposed to other states. So the story of um, bias in, against the ICC, um, against, bias in the ICC against Africans is, is perhaps a little bit more nuanced than this um, cartoon would present. But that's something that we're going to be talking a lot about in discussion and that I hope um, some of you will address in your papers as well. So we're going to finish up here by um, talking about what is undoubtedly the, the latest challenge, but also perhaps the latest legitimacy bolstering move um, uh, that has impacted the ICC in, in recent years. And that is that the ICC is now trying to prosecute members of, well, I should say now potentially trying to prosecute members of the US military. Um, to my knowledge, no uh, specific names have been dropped at this point by the ICC prosecutor. But in September, in September 2017, the, the latest prosecutor who took over from uh, Luis Moreno Campo, her name is um, Fatou Bensouda, she decided to launch an investigation into war crimes 
and crimes against humanity committed by the Taliban, Afghan forces, and the U.S. military, as well as the CIA, in Afghanistan between the years 2003 and 2014. And uh, the prosecutor, Fatou Bansouda, has stated that there is reasonable basis to believe that since May 2003, members of the U.S. Armed Forces and the CIA have committed war, the war crimes of torture and cruel treatment, outrages upon personal dignity, and rape, and other forms of sexual violence pursuant to a policy approved by U.S. authorities. Um, and there's, I've linked the... Um, uh, the Times article that, that, that she is quoted in here for, for your reference, so you can read more about this. Um, the, and this comes on, this investigation came on the heels of increased reporting of casualties of civilians in Afghanistan allegedly caused by the U.S. military. Um, and there, I assigned you a video on this that goes more into the allegations. It's pretty graphic and horrifying, so just warning there if that's something that's going to upset you. You don't have to watch it, um, although I, I think it is important to, to watch it to be informed of, of what the U.S. military is, is accused of on a global scale. Um, in, in April 2019, the U.N. put out a report that found that the U.S. and Afghan forces killed more civilians in 2019. Um, uh, sorry, in the first three months of 2019 than, than, than the Taliban did. So on the, on the heels of this reporting that there had been an increase, um, or, or perhaps not even an increase, but finally just more um, international scrutiny cast on the um, activities of the CIA and the U.S. military in Afghanistan, the special prosecutor decided to um, um, launched this investigation. And again, the, the investigation is also, um, it, she's also investigating the Taliban and Afghan forces. Um, the, the CIA and the U.S. military are being investigated, I think, to a lesser extent than those two other actors. But they are still included in this, um, this investigation that could potentially lead to the prosecution of U.S. military officials in the ICC, which would be unprecedented. Um, so you might be thinking at this point, how can the... ICC prosecutor launch a case against U.S. military officials when the U.S. has not signed or ratified the Rome Statute. Again, remember that uh, the ICC can tr prosecute crimes that were committed on the territory of any ICC state party, and the Af uh, Afghanistan has signed and ratified the Rome Statute, and um, is to some extent cooperating with this ICC investigation. So the ICC has actually actually has the jurisdiction to um, to try U.S. military officials, even though the U.S. has not ratified the Rome Statute. So as you can imagine, the U.S. response to this has um, been uh, an, an absolute rejection of of this latest development. The U.S. has uh, protested the ICC's jurisdiction to prosecute American military officials. In uh, March 2020, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, argued that the U.S. is not a party to the ICC and we will take all measures necessary to protect our citizens from this renegade so-called court. So this is a clear hit at the ICC's legitimacy and also the ICC's, ju ICC's jurisdiction. Um, but again, these, these crimes were committed in Afghanistan, or these alleged crimes were committed in Afghanistan. Um, so the ICC does indeed have, have jurisdiction over whoever committed those crimes, um, no matter what nationality the, the accused is. Um, in June 2020, uh, there's been a recent escalation of the American uh, attack on the ICC. And again, the video that I assigned goes into this in more detail. But Mike Pompeo again went on the offensive in June and said, we cannot, we will not stand by as our people are threatened by a kangaroo court. And then in uh, June 2020, President Trump authorized economic and travel sanctions against ICC employees, and he revoked uh, Ben Suda's visa, her American visa. Uh, as we talked about uh, during our discussion session this morning, the U.S. has incredible control over the world's financial capital. So one thing that they've done is that they've freeze, they've, the U.S. has frozen assets of ICC employees um, uh, that are either traveling through uh, or being transferred through the, through the U.S. or or registered in the U.S. Those those assets have, um, for the most part, been been frozen as a response to this investigation of U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan. So, the big debate 
is, is this the death knell of the ICC? Now that the, that the United States, the most powerful state in the world, um, arguably, has decided to go after the ICC. Well, maybe it is, but maybe not. Um, and, and Ben Suda's statements uh, to this effect and, and her um, continued pursual of this case, um, despite the uh, uh, objection from the U.S., indicates that the ICC might actually not be concerned that much with the U.S.'s um, refusal to, to acknowledge their, their jurisdiction or, or the legitimacy of, of the court in, in and of itself. Because actually, this could be a pretty big legitimacy boost. I mean, if the ICC is able to pull this case off, if it ever actually gets to trial, if they ever actually name names and like try to extradite specific American um, military members, military officials, uh, that could, could actually prove that the ICC is, is powerful um, and that international law can, pardon the pun, but trump the interests of, of powerful states. Even if these officials are never convicted, that would still be um, a power move that, that could perhaps really enhance the, the legitimacy of not only the ICC itself, but this idea of individual criminal accountability for international human rights crimes in general. So uh, it remains to see, it may, re remains to be seen, excuse me, how all that is going to end. Um, I'm certainly keeping tabs on that story every day just because this is unprecedented and, and super interesting. Um, so I hope that we can have um, a productive discussion about that on, on Wednesday. Okay, so uh, we are rounding the corner here into the, the home stretch of this course. Next steps, we're going to talk about humanitarian intervention as well as uh, a discussion on gender dynamics and war. So Reed Clark and Erbst, 1996, Cooperman, 2008, Parashar, 2009. Um, the Schoberg article is long. I think it's almost 40 pages. Don't read the whole thing. I would like you to skim it. You know, first sentence of every paragraph is, is what I usually tell people, topic sentences. Um, and if, you, if you're interested, of course, go ahead and, and read it. But um, there's going to be a lot of more, more reading than we've been doing the past couple weeks on that day. So I just wanted to, to um, be sure that you knew that you could just lightly skim over the Schoberg piece. And I'll cover it in my lecture, too, as well. So it's, it's not a huge deal if you can't get to it. Um, OK. So I think that's all I have for you all today, and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Thanks.